President, fellows, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a, a great honour to be asked to deliver this lecture. And I'm very grateful to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and to the Scottish History Society for the invitation to do so. I hope you're not too disappointed that my talk isn't accompanied by strong Lumiere effects. Simon Gilmore seemed to be rather phased by the fact that I didn't have PowerPoint uh, or any other technological bells and whistles. I hope what I have to say will be understandable without any such visual aids. At one level, I think my title is self-explanatory. I hope so anyway. I want to examine the debates about Britain that took place in 17th century Scotland. Or if debate is perhaps too grandiose a word for what I'm dealing with, let's say disputes, conflicts, uh, negotiations about Britain's constitutional arrangements. What lies behind this is my sense that we're too often led to believe that the Union with England dates from 1707. 1707 is not, of course, an unimportant date. As I'm sure you all know, this was when, by the terms of the Treaty of Union, a single parliament and a single state under the name of the United Kingdom of Great Britain was created. Yet this was no more the beginning of negotiations over Scotland's relations with England than it was their end. As I'm sure you also know, the terms of the Union are currently the subject of just a little bit of debate. And although the date of the referendum on Scottish independence has now been set, it would be naive, as Jenny has just pointed out, to think that that debate will actually end on the 18th of September 2014. Whatever the outcome of the referendum, Scotland's relations with England will remain subject to ongoing negotiation, perhaps even more intensely than is the case today in what is, after all, something of a phony propaganda war that we're being subjected to at the moment. However that may be, my point is not just that debating Britain has no foreseeable end point, but that 1707 is a wholly inappropriate starting point. The Union, after all, dates not from 1707, but from 1603, when James VI of Scotland became also James I of England and Ireland. And as we'll see in a moment, debates over British Union predated the Stuart family's long-anticipated dynastic coup by many decades. There's something thoroughly misleading about the, the argument that in 1707, with the loss of its parliament, Scotland also lost its sovereignty and independence. For this assumes that sovereignty was vested in that parliament, a contention that may now be common currency, but that was in fact precisely the source of the 17th century constitutional conflicts of which the parliamentary union was in some respects a product. This is something uh, to which I'll return now and again in the course of my talk and again by way of conclusion. For now it will suffice to note that the view that 17th century Scotland was an independent kingdom exercising independent sovereignty was not one to which James VI or any of his Stuart successors would have subscribed. For, for him, for James and his successors, and indeed for their loyal Scottish subjects, sovereignty was vested in the person of the king. And he could no more have left it behind him when he flitted to London in 1603 than he could have left his head, or his arm, or his leg. And therein, of course, lies the source of many of the 17th century debates about Britain to which my title refers. How does a kingless kingdom govern itself? How do you make absentee monarchy work? How does one sovereign rule multiple kingdoms? I'm going to come back to the idea of multiple monarchy in a second, but there's another level of debate to which my title was also intended to allude, and that is a modern historiographical debate over what British history actually is, and whether or not it is possible, or even desirable, to write it. Now here I'm referring to John Pocock, another of my early mentors, along with Nick Philipson, uh, to whom I owe an enormous debt. And John Pocock challenged historians of Britain to rethink what it was they were writing a history of, and to be more sensitive to the interactions of the various polities as these had developed over time in what he liked to call the Atlantic Archipelago, a rather ugly, convoluted phrase made, he thought, necessary by justifiable Irish resistance to inclusion under a British terminological umbrella. For Pocock, a New Zealander working in the United States, 
that Great Britain encompasses much more than the constitutional relations between Scotland and England. It speaks to a wider inquiry into what Britain is, and Pocock's Britain actually includes its erstwhile colonial dependencies, like New Zealand, and how its history can be conceived and written. It's no coincidence, I think, that Pocock's critique of traditional British history, that is an essentially triumphalist, triumphalist Whig history of England with occasional Celtic embellishments, it's no coincidence that his critique of this was launched in the 1970s when a self-confident sense of Britishness was rapidly eroding in the face of a receding empire and the prospect of economic union with Europe, one of Pocock's real bugbears. Nor really is it surprising that historians of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland, while doffing their caps to Pocock's British and archipelagic agenda, have by and large remained historians of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Not only is British history as Pocock conceived it fiendishly difficult to, to write, but it has none of the emotional or psychological traction that histories of the island's constituent parts continue to enjoy. And that in itself, I think, is a telling point in any discussion of Britain's future as well as its past. In any case, for historians of early modern Britain and Ireland, Pocock's archipelagic paradigm has in many respects meshed with, and perhaps even given way to, a frame of reference that takes its cue from another John, John Eliot, Eliot's conception of a Europe of composite monarchies. A Europe that is made up of agglomerations of kingdoms and principalities, owing allegiance to a single ruler as a result primarily of dynastic inheritance. The Spanish monarchy, of which of course Eliot is the preeminent historian, is the preeminent example, a composite of a range of Iberian kingdoms and polities, Castile, Aragon, Leon, Catalonia, and for a time Portugal, together with kingdoms and principalities uh, in Italy and the Low Countries. But there are a range of other early modern examples of this kind of multiple monarchy, Brandenburg, Prussia, Poland, Lithuania, Denmark, Norway, and of course, Scotland, England, with the latter's Welsh uh, and Irish dependencies. So let's explore the idea of Britain and Ireland as a composite or multiple monarchy in a little more detail, because it offers important insights into how contemporaries may have understood the union that came into existence in 1603. John Eliot quotes a 17th century Spanish jurist, Juan de Solorzano Pereira, as distinguishing between two kinds of union. The first was what Solorzano called accessory union, a union whereby one territory was simply incorporated into and ruled in the same way as another territory, subject to its government and its laws. We might prefer the term incorporated to accessory, and we might point in a British context, as indeed does Eliot, to the incorporation of Wales into a greater English state by the Acts of Union of 1536 and 1543. But Solorzano identified another form of union, one that was typical of the sprawling Spanish monarchy, and that is a more appropriate way of characterizing how 16, 1603 was perceived in Britain, or at least how it was perceived in Scotland. And this Solorzano described in a Latin phrase as a union aeque principaliter, a union in which the parties were literally equally important, aeque principaliter, within which they were accorded parity of status and esteem, and within which they continued to be governed according to their own customs and traditions, their own laws and liberties. In this sort of multiple monarchy, and here I think I'm probably borrowing a formulation of Jenny Wormald's, the ruler was certainly king of all, but he was also king of each. In the immediate aftermath of 1603, in an excess of unionist fervor, James VI and I famously proposed that Scotland and England be brought together in what he called a perfect union. It's not entirely clear what he meant by this, but he does seem to have envisaged Scots and English uniting to form something other and greater than the sum of their parts. <coughs> the new Britain and its new British subjects would subsume ancient ethnic identities and animosities in a new and presumably unitary British kingdom and nation. 
However, while he was able by royal prerogative to invent a new British flag, the Union Jack, and to adopt a new royal style, King of Britain, France and Ireland, rather than simply uh, King of Scotland, England, France and Ireland, he couldn't gain the approval of the English Parliament even for these measures, let alone for the more sweeping union of laws, parliaments, and perhaps even religious practices that he seems to have envisaged. Sir Edwin Sands, leading the opposition to James's British project in the English House of Commons, proposed that the most perfect union achievable was in fact an accessory or incorporated union that would simply see Scotland assimilated like Wales before it into a greater England. But this, as Sands well knew, and it was intended as a wrecking measure, would be much too much for the king to stomach, let alone the king's Scottish subjects. For the Scots, a union aequae principaliter, in which they were accorded parity of status and esteem, and in which their local laws and liberties were guaranteed, was the only equitable solution. A union of the crowns, but not of the kingdoms. In fact, this had been what you might call the Scots' default position as regards dynastic union for centuries. It was first articulated in the Treaty of Burgum of 1290, the treaty by which the heir to the Scottish throne, uh, Margaret, maid of Norway, was promised in marriage to Prince Edward, son of Edward I, the future Edward II. Similarly, it was central to the Treaty of Greenwich of 1543, by which Mary Queen of Scots was betrothed to Henry VIII's son and heir, another Prince Edward, who would later become Edward VI. Neither of these marriages took place, but the negotiations surrounding them and indeed much of the history of Anglo-Scottish relations in the late medieval period, speak to the Scots' fear of simply being absorbed into a greater England, and the need to defend their ancient and perhaps deliberately ill-defined laws and liberties. And this was hardly just uh, Scottish paranoia. If English attempts to realize hegemony over the Atlantic archipelago were sporadic and never wholly successful, they were nonetheless very real and very persistent. The Scots had only to look to Wales and Ireland to see where they stood when it came to the English crown's aspirations. And they too had suffered from its bullying imperialism. Unlike Wales and Ireland, however, at least in their own eyes, the Scots had long since fought and won the right to be treated, aequae principaliter, as an independent kingdom, to enter into union with England on the basis of parity of status and esteem, and not to be incorporated into a greater England. They would not, in other words, be an English accessory. They would not accessorize the English body politic like a handbag or a pair of earrings, a rather surreal image entirely of my own invention. <laughs> Yet perhaps not such a far-fetched image. In 1603, after all, one cautiously enthusiastic Scottish Unionist, a lawyer called John Russell, expressed concern that Scotland might end up as a pendicle, a pendant of England, subaltern to its English partner, and thereby lose her beauty forever. God forbid, he added, though fortunately without pursuing any further my accessorizing analogy. More seriously, Russell was in effect expressing an understanding of the Union of 1603 as one of equals, a partnership between two kingdoms based on parity of status and esteem. This view had first been set out in detail by one of the most distinguished Scottish academics of the early 16th century, Johannes Meyer, John Mayer, not to be confused with the modern prime minister of that name, theologian, logician and philosopher who also turned his hand to history publishing in Paris in 1521, his punningly titled Historia Maioris Britanniae Tam Angliae Crown Scotiae, that is, the history of Greater Britain, as well England as Scotland. The pun on Maior Britanniae, Mayor's Britain as well as Greater Britain, should remind us that they are actually used greater in a purely quantitative and geographical sense to distinguish Britain from Brittany, Britannia Minor, or Little Britain. It was only subsequently, though perhaps as early as the 1540s, that Great Britain acquired an additional qualitative uh, dimension. Be that as it may, Mayer's history of Greater Britain was indeed a history of England as well as Scotland, though it, was hard, though it would hardly pass as British history in a Pococchian sense. <clears throat> 
Rather, it interleaves chapters on England with chapters on Scotland that together tell the story of the development of both kingdoms from their origins until the late 15th century. This was in itself an innovative enough approach to the history of the two British kingdoms. But it, still more remarkable is that Mayer used the device of writing their histories in tandem as a platform for arguing the case for dynastic union between them. Critically, though, this union would be a union aequi principaliter. Although Mayer did not, at least as far as I know, use that particular phrase, there is no question that in his eyes an Anglo-Scottish union could only be successfully accomplished if it was seen as a union of equals, a partnership between two kingdoms of equal status. Now, on the face of it, this is a quite reasonable position. I'm sure most of your Scots would agree with that. And it's one to which mutatis mutandis, the Scots might be said to have adhered, or at least aspired, from that day to this, a union based on parity of status and esteem. But as Mayer himself recognized, this is, this is not as entirely unproblematic a position as it seems at first sight. And here I want to fly a kite that I've flown before in the hope that it doesn't crash and burn this time quite as quickly as it did the last. You are, I'm sure, all perfectly familiar with the West Lothian question. That peculiar constitutional anomaly that has arisen as a result of what political scientists call asymmetrical devolution. That seems to be something of a euphemism for the hand-to-mouth way in which the ramshackle British constitution has developed. The result has been the creation of a situation in which Westminster has devolved a range of different powers and jurisdictions to representative assemblies at Holyrood and elsewhere, while still functioning as both the UK Parliament and, by default, an English Parliament. As Tam Diel, then the MP for West Lothian, famously argued at an early stage in the devolution debates, this means that while he as a Westminster MP could vote on matters relating exclusively to England, he had no say in matters affecting his own constituency that were legislated on in Scotland. While he could legislate for West Bromwich, he couldn't legislate for West Lothian. The West Lothian question now serves as shorthand for the constitutional absurdities that devolution has created. For the Scottish National Party, the solution to the question is perfectly simple, independence. For unionists, it's much more problematic, and thus far has proved pretty much insoluble. It might most, might most obviously be resolved by some form of federal constitution that formally separated an English parliament from a UK parliament. Yet here we are confronted not by the anomalies of asymmetric devolution, but by the harsh realities of the UK's asymmetrical political geography. How can you make federalism work in a multinational state so obviously dominated by one of its constituent parts? The size of that challenge can be illustrated demographically and quite quickly. Of the total population of the United Kingdom, 53 million live in England, 5.3 million live in Scotland. 3 million live in Wales, and 2 million in Northern Ireland. In other words, in terms of population, England dwarfs all three of its smaller partners and neighbours put together by a ratio of more or less 5 to 1, while it has 10 times more inhabitants than Scotland alone. Pierre Trudeau, the Canadian Prime Minister, once memorably quipped that his country's relationship with the United States was like being in bed with an elephant. And the metaphor is now frequently used to characterize Scotland's relations with England. Yet one is sometimes tempted to describe it as an elephant in the room rather than the bed because the sheer scale of the disparity remains so often unacknowledged. John Mayer, in his 1521 History of Greater Britain, was, I think, the first person to address this issue directly. And although he offered no solution beyond a union aequi principaliter, he deserves some credit for at least acknowledging its existence. Mayer was very proud that he was born at Glegg Horney near Haddington and subsequently educated at the town's grammar school uh, in Haddington. So I would suggest, with apologies to Tam Diel, that we credit Mayer with inventing the East Lothian question. 
That is the challenge of engineering a union based on parity of status and esteem when the partners in that union are so demonstrably unequal in terms of population and, one might add, resources. There's maybe something in the East Lothian air. You Edinburghers will know this better than I. Uh, or perhaps it's a, it's a product of its early Anglian settlement, but Mayer is by no means the only unionist from that part of Scotland to have wrestled with this conundrum. John Knox, also of Haddington, was similarly exercised by the issue, and perhaps more pertinently to present discussion, so too was Andrew Fletcher of Salton, Saltoon, uh, at the time of the Parliamentary Union of 1707. And if you're looking for a modern representative, what about John P. McIntosh, the highly influential devolutionist who is MP for Berwick and East Lothian in the 1960s and 70s, and is in fact buried uh, in Gifford in East Lothian. That's something of a self-indulgent digression. As the case of John Mayer suggests, it is one thing to acknowledge a problem, but quite another to solve it. There is a sense in which the East Lothian question and the disparities in population and resources that lie behind it haunted Anglo-Scottish relations in the early modern period just as they do today. In fact, the disparities were not quite so pronounced then as they are now. England's population in 1600 was maybe 4 million, while Scotland's was a little less than 1 million, and Ireland, North and South, was probably closer to 1.5 million. Interestingly, London at 200,000 was already big enough in 1600 to skew the entire English economy. And by 1700, it was at 550,000, well over half a million, the biggest metropolis on the planet. The population of Edinburgh, by comparison, had grown from maybe 15,000 in 1600 to 50,000 in 1700, less than a tenth of the size of the English capital. I'm using these figures purely for illustrative purposes. If I wanted to pursue this line of argument further, it would require a much more detailed analysis, not only of population, but of economic growth and output, GDP, and so on and so forth. And this, you'll be glad to hear, uh, I'm not qualified to undertake. So I'll content myself with having laid bare, at least to my own satisfaction, the terms of the East Lothian question, and return in the light of that question to 17th century debates uh, about Britain. Two general points, one really the reverse of the other, may be made here that run through these debates and stem directly from the disparities between Scotland and England that I have highlighted. For most 17th century English people, the difference between England and Britain was little more than a semantic quibble, plus a change, I hear many of you say. It is the Scots, then as now, who followed James VI and I in insisting that it must mean something other and greater than the sum of its parts. You do occasionally find the term Anglo-Britannus or Anglo-Britannicus in 17th century sources. You can even find Cambro Britannus, Welsh Britons, who were, of course, Britons. But Scoto Britannus is much, much, much more common. Just as in the 18th century, North Britain to describe Scots is much more common than South Britons to describe the English. In other words, and not surprisingly, it was the Scots who were concerned about making multiple monarchy work in a way that neither disadvantaged them nor compromised their kingdom's autonomy and identity. The reverse of this, the other side of the same coin, was that the English were, for the most part, wholly indifferent to the implications of union and multiple monarchy. And when occasionally prodded out of their indifference, their default attitude was at best condescension and at worst outright hostility. <coughs> when Anthony Weldon, or whoever the author of a 16th century description of Scotland was, sorry, a 1617 description of Scotland was, when he wrote that the country was too good for those that inhabit it and too bad for others to be at the charge of conquering it, he was expressing a view that was probably shared by most of his English uh, compatriots. They had accepted grudgingly the accession of a Scottish king to the English throne. The alternative, after all, was in all probability a war of English succession. But they had no further interest in a country that offered much less economic and social opportunities than Ireland, where ambitious Englishmen had traditionally gone to make their fortunes. No further interest, that is, unless or until Scotland posed a threat to English security, a point to which I'll have to return. <coughs> 
In the light of this, what's most surprising about 17th century Britain is not that multiple monarchy was subject to all kinds of stresses and strains to the point where in the mid 17th century it completely collapsed, but that despite the acute destabilization brought about by what we now call the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, the Union of Scotland and England survived. By way of comparison, in 1580, Portugal entered into a dynastic union with the Spanish monarchy, with Castile, becoming part of the Habsburgs' vast composite monarchy. But in 1640, when the Spanish monarchy similarly succumbed to unsupportable internal and external pressures, Portugal found itself a new royal dynasty and successfully reasserted its status as a wholly independent kingdom. This, or so it appears, was never an option that the Scots considered with any seriousness. And perhaps this is worth uh, looking at a little bit more closely. One reason for cleaving to the Stuart line and thus to continuing the union was the lack of any credible alternative. It's hard to imagine that any other Scottish noble family even one with royal blood flowing through their veins, those perennial bridesmaids, the Hamiltons, come to mind. It's hard to imagine that they could have come to the throne without plunging the country into internecine strife. Yet there's also perhaps a more positive, if paradoxical, reason. That is the fact that the Stuart dynasty had come to be the most powerful symbol, guarantor, of Scottish autonomy and identity. The reigning Stuart monarch was a living embodiment of Scotland's status as the most ancient kingdom in Europe, lineally descended from Fergus I, who, the Scots insisted, had founded the kingdom in 330 BC, and from whom had sprung an unbroken line of over a hundred kings. You may well be familiar with their portraits, hanging in the ballroom of Hollywood Palace, strikingly similar in their looks, all with a somewhat protruding Stuart nose and all painted by the same Dutch artist, Jacob de Witt, for James, Duke of York, the future James VII and II in the early 1680s, and using probably only one or two sitters to ensure the family resemblance throughout the line. This was not an exercise in royal vanity, or at least not just an exercise in royal vanity. If it had been, one suspect the portraits would have been of much higher quality. <laughs> Nor was it an exercise in proto-Jacobite nostalgia, though it would in time become an exercise in Jacobite nostalgia. For Scots before 1690, though, the line of kings was proof positive and thus critical validation of their status as an independent kingdom, their right to be treated aequae principalito within the Stuarts' multiple British monarchy. This was true, paradoxically, but revealingly, even when the Stuart king in question was as anglicised and authoritarian as Charles I. No Stuart monarch rode roughshod or allowed his servants to ride roughshod over local laws and liberties, whether Scottish, English or Irish, as did the sainted royal martyr Charles I. And when Oliver Cromwell finally took the law into his own hands, orchestrating the king's trial and execution in 1649 for crimes against the Commonwealth and reinventing England as a republic, what did the Scots do? They immediately proclaimed the king's son and heir, Charles II, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. It's an interesting question what Cromwell would have done had the Scots simply proclaimed Charles II King of Scots. Yet it's unlikely that it would have allowed an independent Scottish monarchy to be resurrected on England's northern frontier. When not deluded by religious zeal, there was a brutal pragmatism, even honesty, about Oliver Cromwell. There was never any doubt in his mind that the Atlantic archipelago was or should be subject to English rule. Yet he clearly distinguished between Ireland as a conquered and colonized dependency and Scotland as something more akin to an irritating satellite that if not brought to heel would pose a serious threat to the security of the English Republic. The solution to his Scottish problem was therefore military conquest accomplished with considerable efficiency and the forcible incorporation of Scotland into an enlarged English Republic. There was nothing pretty about this form of accessory union. Yet it was not without a cosmetic dimension. Cromwell had no interest at all in the language of Britain, but, in the, in, but the 1654 ordinance for uniting Scotland into one Commonwealth with England does describe him as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland, etc. 
a somewhat disingenuous allusion to a sort of multiple republic rather than simply an enlarged English one. The reality was that in a concession to their erstwhile independence, the Scots were generously admitted to the benefits of England's much vaunted laws and liberties, albeit laws and liberties now savagely attenuated by military dictatorship. And the Scots too were allotted 30 seats in what was a now powerless English parliament. Cromwell also bestowed two further benefits on the Scots. The first, free trade with England, is one to which I'll have to return in a moment. The second was what he understood as religious toleration. So far, religion has barely figured in this lecture. <clears throat> this has been quite deliberate because religious issues have a tendency to dominate discussions of the 17th century, and it's salutary now and again to approach things from a rather different perspective. But there does come a point when religion simply cannot be ignored any longer, and I think I've probably reached that point. In fact, the Union of 1603 was often construed in religious terms, not least by James VI and I himself, as the fulfillment of a providential scheme, a divine plan to create a Protestant Britain that would be safe from the corrupting depredations of continental Catholicism. James resisted a messianic or apocalyptic view of his role as the leader of the forces of Christ against the Antichrist, but this did not prevent some of his subjects, Scots and English alike, from continuing to think in these terms and from being uh, continuously disappointed when the king never fulfilled them. Be that as it may, Protestantism and Britain's geographical isolation did sort of incubate a common Anglo-Scottish religious culture, one that excluded and demonized the Catholic Irish, that at least at a superficial level promoted the kind of pan-British unity that initially James was so keen on. But if there was in post-Reformation something of a common Protestant culture, it needs to be recognized that there were in fact a large number of Protestantisms, and that post-1603 Britain was as much divided by its common faith as it was united. If Scots and English could make common cause against Catholics, that was in most instances the limits of their agreement and cooperation. And it was, of course, precisely because of what the Scots perceived as Charles I's attempts to anglicize, or worse, Catholicize, the church in Scotland, that acted <clears throat> as the rallying, rallying point for the wide range of grievances about their provincialization within uh, an increasingly Anglo-British imperial monarchy that led to the outbreak of the Covenanting Revolution in 1638. And it was a misapprehension of English Protestantism a complete misunderstanding of what it was about, together with a large dose of religious hubris that led Scottish Presbyterians to believe that Charles's parliamentary opponents in England shared their vision of a Presbyterian Britain. The years between 1638 and 1643, between the drawing up of the National Covenant in Scotland and the signing of the Solemn League and Covenant between uh, Scots and English opponents of Charles I, these were the years when the, the Scots called the British shots in a way that they had never done before and would never do again. There were years, too, when Scottish Presbyterians succeeded not only in entrenching their religious views as somehow intrinsically Scottish, but in linking them to a constitutional revolution that redefined the nature and location of sovereignty. As the Scottish coronation of Charles II in 1651 made clear, if Scottish Presbyterianism posed no threat to the Stuart monarchy's survival, it would nonetheless be a Stuart monarchy that lacked the absolute sovereignty that had accompanied James VI to London in 1603. This vision of a Scottish constitutional monarchy was developed in the context of a multiple British monarchy, a monarchy in which Scotland's status as Ique Principaliter was initially, albeit grudgingly accepted by English parliamentarians, who were desperately in need of the Scottish army. Subsequently, however, it was decisively rejected by Oliver Cromwell once he had created his own new model army and was in a position and felt under pressure to secure the English Republic's northern frontier by military conquest. Cromwell was as ill dis disposed towards Presbyterianism as he was towards Episcopacy. Both stood for the kind of repressive clericalism 
which he as an independent found utterly abhorrent. Yet while Presbyterian Scotland was much less offensive than Catholic Ireland, Cromwell's attempts to introduce toleration for what the Scots denounced as sectaries had very little uh, impact. Though Scottish Presbyterians bickered and fissured amongst themselves, there was no equivalent in Scotland of the explosion of sects, levellers, diggers, Quakers and the like that we associate with Cromwellian England. Cromwell's religious innovations, therefore, had little or no impact on Scotland. Indeed, the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 saw the restoration of episcopacy, along with an Anglo-British royal court that acted as it had before the so-called Troubles, as the hub of the Stuarts' multiple monarchy. Normal service had been resumed, though with an undertow of threatening Presbyterian dissent that Scotland's ruling elite found very hard to cope with. There is perhaps a sense, though this might be considered a little old-fashioned, in which the Scottish rest Restoration Settlement was thoroughly anti-clerical, that the political elite was as wary of the clerical pretensions of the Presbyterians as they were of the bishops, and that they were determined that neither the one nor the other should be allowed to rule the roost at their expense, as they had in the 1630s in the case of the bishops, or the late 1640s in the case of the Presbyterian ministers. Religious conformity, religious uniformity, was not the spiritual imperative that it had once been. Rather, it had become a political expedient, essential to the social order and stability that had been overturned in the covenanting era with what were seen as catastrophic results. In short, the Restoration elite was concerned above all with restoring its social and political dominance, along with its economic fortunes. I suggested a moment ago that one further innovation introduced by Cromwell was free trade between England and Scotland. This had been a much debated issue in the years after 1603, that had fallen foul of English merchants concerned that it might threaten their commercial dominance. When Cromwell did finally create a British free trade zone in the 1650s, the Scottish economy was in such a powerless state that it seems to have had minimal impact, and in any event, trade barriers were immediately reimposed at the Restoration. <clears throat> Yet the issue of free trade and the benefits to be derived from access to English markets was something that increasingly exercised the minds of the Scots. The growth of commercial empires, French, Spanish, Dutch, and English, all based on mercantilist principles, was gradually squeezing the Scottish economy and posing the East Lothian question in ever more acute and uncomfortable ways. How could the Scots compete with the growth of London, for example, as a global commercial center? Claire Jackson has recently argued that in 1670, the Scots were prompted to enter into negotiations with England that might have produced a settlement not unlike what was hammered out in 1707, parliamentary union in exchange for free trade. That it did not happen in 1670, but that it did in 1707, can be put down crudely to one key difference. In 1670, Scotland posed no real threat to English security. In 1707, it did. Time doesn't allow me to explore Scottish attempts, perfectly aligned with uh, the principle of Aikwe Principaliter, to develop their own commercial empire, attempts that came to a disastrous end on the Isthmus of Darien. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that the context in which the 1707 settlement was reached had been transformed by the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688-90. The replacement of the main line of the Stuarts, now openly Catholic, with a cadet but Protestant branch represented by that curiously composite monarch, William and Mary, and subsequently by the childless Mary's sister, Anne. Although the revolution was very much made in England, it had a transformative effect on Scotland. Not only did Presbyterians seize the opportunity to regain control of the Scottish church, a control that they have never subsequently lost, but they reaffirmed their association with constitutional monarchy by affirming the revolution principles that made it impossible for the monarch to reign without recourse to Parliament. These were principles first articulated in Scotland and England, as we've seen in the 1640s, and if they did not in the 1690s lead to the monarchy's collapse, they did expose a glaring weakness in the governance of the Stuarts' asymmetrical multiple monarchy. For just as sovereignty was no longer vested exclusively in the person of the monarch, 
as a person, is if uh, you uh, take Mary and William as two people rather than one. So it was now also laid claim to sovereignty, that is, by two competing parliaments. By the late 17th century, the idea of the sovereignty of the crown and parliament, which is a very peculiar English idea, had considerable currency in England. But it seems rarely, if ever, to have crossed any Englishman's mind that sovereignty might actually be vested in the crown in parliaments, plural. Indeed, it only emerged as an issue, or miraculous, more accurately, an emergency, when the Scottish Parliament sought to prevail on the British monarchy to exercise sovereignty in a way that contradicted the wishes of the English Parliament. Now, the issue was, of course, the royal succession and the English Parliament's decision in 1701 to forestall any future disputes over the succession by vesting it in the House of Hanover. The decision was taken against a backdrop of massively expensive wars with France that were conducted by the Crown with the English Parliament's support, but which were, generally speaking, very much against Scotland's interests. The issue of the succession gave the Scottish Parliament leverage, the opportunity to seek redress for the many grievances that had been building up over the previous two decades. In effect, an opportunity to renegotiate the terms of the Union. Unlike in 1670, on this occasion, they had England's full attention. An independent Scotland allied to France was a nightmare scenario that the Crown and its London administration simply could not tolerate. The settlement of 1707, then, from this perspective, was simply an act of force majeure by which England answered the East Lothian question and destroyed the fiction of union aequae principaliter by insisting that the Scottish Parliament voted itself out of existence, by insisting that, forcibly if necessary, any rival to the sovereignty of the Crown in the English Parliament was neutralised. It's perhaps a measure of the urgency of the situation that the London government, rather like Cromwell, though with a little bit more subtlety, was prepared to make wholesale concessions to ensure Scottish compliance. The fiction that this was a treaty between two sovereign powers, that a new kingdom of Great Britain had been created, that the addition of a small number of Scots to the new British Parliament would radically alter its rootedness in English legal and parliamentary traditions. All this served to disguise what was a shotgun union that incorporated Scotland into an English body politic as surely as Cromwell's ordinance of 1654. Yet it was by no means a truly incorporating union. Scotland was not entirely accessorized. Its Presbyterian Kirk and distinct religious culture, its legal establishment and the whole paraphernalia of local franchise courts, so beloved of the nobility, uh, its universities and education system, these were all guaranteed either in the treaty itself or by separate legislative enactment. And of course, free trade with England and its colonies, initially something of a mixed blessing, was granted, along with hefty compensation, a massive financial inducement for Scots taking on in, uh, their share of England's national debt. Arguably, the Scots had driven a pretty hard bargain, extracting a range of concessions that allowed them to maintain and develop what we would, might now call uh, a distinct civil uh, society and culture. I began by suggesting that while 1707 is certainly an important date in the history of Scotland's relations with England, it was by no means the beginning of the debate over the nature of the British Union. What I'm tempted to say now, in the light of uh, the foregoing, is that what it did signal was the end of the Stuarts' multiple monarchy, and of any attempt to construct ways of governing such a monarchy on the basis of parity of status and esteem. <coughs> Subsequently, any attempts to reassert Scotland's status, aequae principaliter, not least 19th and 20th century moves towards home rule, would ru run up against the increasingly intense doctrine of the sovereignty of a UK Parliament that was, and is, predominantly English. That doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty has now been tested as never before. What I've characterized as the East Lothian question, the issue of the UK's asymmetric political geography, has to some extent been addressed by devolution. But asymmetric devolution has in turn exposed the serious anomalies summed up in the West Lothian question. 
Next year's referendum is of itself a direct challenge to the now rather tired, threadbare idea of parliamentary sovereignty. And the Scottish National Party has rather astutely spun an engaging narrative that deeply embeds notions of popular sovereignty in Scottish history and indeed in the Scottish psyche. Whether this will actually convince the Scots to withdraw from the Union is still very much a moot point. What is not open to question, as Jenny said in her introduction, is that the debate over Britain is set to run and run and run and run. Thank you very much.